Good morning. I'm Jerry Heron, director of the Honors Program. I'm delighted to welcome you to FOCUS, the Forum on Contemporary Issues in Society. FOCUS provides a unique opportunity for the university community to do something that we do very well here at Wayne State, to think together about solving problems. FOCUS identifies a single important issue and allows us to address that issue with all the resources that a great university and a great city can bring to bear. This morning's lecture does not mark an end point then. Instead, it's the beginning of a conversation about the press and the presidency, about citizenship and conscience, about reflection and action, a conversation that engages both the university and our community. The true test of the effectiveness is in how we respond as we go forward, how effectively we integrate what Bob Woodward will share with us today here how we integrate these ideas into plans for being civic-minded, promoting responsible discourse, encouraging tough questions, and facilitating community action. FOCUS is an ongoing project initiated by our president, Dr. Irvin D. Reed. During the decade of Dr. Reed's presidency, we have come to recognize him as a tireless and enthusiastic leader who was possessed of an infectious desire for making Wayne State University a catalyst for change, not only among faculty, students, and staff, but in our metropolitan region, our nation, and our world. He is a leader who inspires others to ask, how can I make our world better for tomorrow? Dr. Reed became Wayne State University's ninth president in 1997. Since that time, Wayne State has grown in prominence. Under his leadership, the university has completed hundreds of millions of dollars in new construction, including a major expansion of the law school, three residence halls, the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, the Mort Harris Recreation and Fitness Center, and a Welcome Center Complex. WSU also broke ground on University Village, a $36 million residential and retail establishment on the former site of the Verner's ginger, ginger Ale Factory on the south side of our campus. One of President Reed's most far-reaching achievements has been the creation of Tech Town, a 43-acre technology park adjacent to the Wayne State campus. Tech Town now has more than 40 tenant businesses that are helping revitalize the city and the state economies. And perhaps most exciting, well, certainly to me, has been the expansion of the honors program. <laughs> Thanks to President Reed's leadership and vision, the Board of Governors authorized the creation of the Wayne State University Honors College this last January. We will be welcoming our inaugural Honors College class as of the fall of 2008. Many awards have been bestowed upon President Reed during his years at Wayne State University, including his being named a Michiganian of the Year by the Detroit News and a Newsmaker of the Year by Crane's Detroit Business. He was also named Entrepreneur of the Year in the Central Great Lakes region by Ernst & Young in recognition of his leadership in supporting businesses spun off from university research. It is my great pleasure now to introduce the ninth president of Wayne State University, Dr. Irvin D. Reed. Good morning. Good morning and thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the second program in Wayne State University's Forum on Contemporary Issues in Society. Today we observe the election year with a look at two of this nation's most sacred and often exasperating institutions, the press and the presidency. The relationship of the press to the presidency has come a long, long way since George Washington, who generally received tolerance, if not adulation, from journalists of his day. But by 1800, the press was unleashed and in full cry. In the election campaign of that year, both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson routinely carried the marks of its teeth and were not at all happy about it. The relationship of the press to the president is kaleidoscopic, intricate, and always changing. No single word or phrase can describe it. Some presidents have had little trouble with the press. John Tyler ordered 300 newspapers holding federal contracts to oppose the nomination of Martin Van Buren, and by God, they did it. Franklin D. Roosevelt has been called the greatest managing editor, and Ronald Reagan characteristically had the media in the palm of his hand. Others had not been so lucky, Herbert Hoover for one, or Richard Nixon for another. 
Jimmy Carter might have spent less time under the media microscope had his presidency not followed so closely on the heels of Watergate, a word our guest this morning helped make a part of the national vocabulary. Today, the press and the executive branch may be suspicious of one another, and each needs the other to do its job. Presidents rely on the media to take their message to the public and to help promote their preferred image. The media rely on presidents to provide news, or at least the raw material from which news can be manufactured. Over the past two decades, we have seen increasingly strong and effective attempts by presidents to manage the news and manipulate the press. What may be less obvious is the press's response. Many people in recent years have wondered aloud what happened to the watchdog press that pursued the Watergate scandal so effectively, or why Britney Spears routinely seems to have more news value even than the president. Add to that an almost universal public distrust of both the media and the executive branch, and you have quite a puzzle, indeed, for anyone wondering where this relationship is going. But if anyone knows, it is Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward is an assistant managing editor at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 1971. In that long and distinguished career, he has received nearly every American journalism award. In 1973, the Post won a Pulitzer Prize for the reporting of Woodward and Carl Bernstein that they did on Watergate scandal. In 2002, Woodward was lead reporter for the Post Pulitzer Prize uh, winning series on the aftermath of the September 11th terror attacks. A man of exceptionally broad interests, Bob Woodward has written or co-authored more number one best-selling non-fiction books nonfiction books than any contemporary American writer. His topics range through Watergate and the fall of the Nixon administration, the Supreme Court, CIA, the first Gulf War, the Clinton presidency, planning and execution of the Iraq War, all the way to such disparate individuals as Alan Greenspan and John Belushi. Newsweek magazine has excerpted five of Bob Woodward's books in cover stories. CBS 60 Minutes has done segments on five of them, and three have been made into movies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob Woodward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, particularly right in the center of an election year, and I'm not going to delude myself and think that this is a representative sample of America or even Michigan, but I'd like to take a poll uh, in terms of who you would like to be the next president, and it's, it seems now it's down to three people, John McCain, Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton. So uh, how many, uh, l let's start uh, the other way around. Uh, how many people would like to see Senator H Hillary Clinton as the next president? Please raise your hands. Only one hand, ma'am. <laughs> Happens every time. How many would like to see Senator Obama as the next president? Raise your hand. Oh, looks like, oh, okay. Uh, how many would like to see Senator McCain as the next president? Raise your hand. Okay, there, okay, good. Well, it looks like Obama has it. At Wayne State. There still is the continuing primary battle and there still is the, uh, the general election. It, it truly is an interesting time, and uh, I think in, uh, no matter how long you live, you look back on this time, uh, 2008, as a moment, one of those hinges of history where the country's going to decide who leads and uh, who leads on what. What uh, my working definition of the job of the President of the United States is 
the president is supposed to define and establish the next stage of good for a majority of people in the country. And the next stage can be winning a war, fixing the economy, health care, the environment. But the president really has to look at that and say, what's the next stage of good for a real majority, not a, one party, not a special interest group or one economic segment, but the general good? And then the president has to say, okay, here's where we're going, uh, here's the plan to get there, and then uh, execute it. A number of years ago, it was 2005, I was having, uh, wound up having dinner with Al Gore, the former vice president. And dinner with Al Gore is taxing. Uh, because he's fully engaged and has all kinds of opinions and uh, he was beating up on me about uh, the first two books I'd written about Bush and his wars saying that I you know I've failed to condemn the war sufficiently and that uh, he felt very strongly uh, against the war and so forth and I said no look my job is to find out what happened and he said, well, no, wait, in Watergate, you took a stand. And I said, no, we didn't. And that uh, the job of the reporter is empirical, find out the facts uh, as much as possible. And he didn't quite buy that, but I persisted. And then we got into a very interesting discussion about how much of consequential events in a, in a presidency is in the public realm. And I said, for instance, you've been, you were vice president to Bill Clinton for eight years. Of the things that went on that are important, uh, how much do we know? I, I'd written books on Clinton, dozens, hundreds of books on Clinton at that point. 24-7 coverage of his presidency in many ways, uh, newspaper articles, tele you know, saturation, coverage. So how much of what went on that's important do we know? I asked hopefully. And Al Gore said, 1%. And I immediately thought to myself, you mean there are that many women we don't know about? <laughs> And then uh, I said, now suppose you, you were vice president, you were there, uh, suppose you wrote a tell-all memoir. And he said, no, I'd never do that. And I said, now suppose you did, I told us everything you knew that was important. How much would we know? And he said, 2%. <laughs> now he obviously wanted to stick it to me and was being, uh, trying to be provocative. Uh, but that's the question for me as a reporter and a book writer. That's the question for you as a citizen. In other words, of what goes on, and, which of course uh, really defines who people are, how much do I know? In other words, in making a judgment, is it 1 percent, 2 percent, 50 percent? I tend to think it's in the 60 to 70 percent range but you don't know what you don't know. And uh, what the job of a reporter is, or uh, in my case, when I spend most of my time on these books or long range pro projects, is to move that percentage from the one or two or five percent realm up into a much higher percentage so people can make uh, sounds like a cliche and it is informed decisions and uh, let me just give you uh, an example of I want to give you two examples uh, one going back to the post Watergate period uh, it was September 1974 and uh, Gerald Ford had been president for one month and you, some of you may recall this period. He went on national television early on a Sunday morning and granted Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. 
And I think Ford went on television early on a Sunday morning hoping no one would notice. <laughs> but people did. And I happened to be asleep in a hotel room in New York that Sunday morning. My colleague, Carl Bernstein, we'd worked on Watergate together, called and woke me up. Said, have you heard? I said, no, I've been asleep. I haven't heard anything. And Carl, who then and still has the ability to explain what went on in the fewest words with the most drama, said the following. The son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> Even I knew what had happened. <laughs> and uh, in that time, uh, it was assumed, and, and I pretty much adopted this, that there was something dirty in the pardon, a deal. Here, 40 people went to jail, all of Nixon's key people, really, and uh, the guy at the top gets a pardon and a free pass. And uh, I thought that for a, a long time, 20, 25 years, and then I decided to do a book on the legacy of Watergate and examine what Watergate and the residue and the lessons or the failure to learn lessons had done to the presidencies of Gerald Ford, uh, Jimmy Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., and Clinton. And in the course of reporting that, I called up Gerald Ford and said, I'm, I, I had not met him, I had not interviewed him, and said, I'm doing this book and I'd like to talk to you, and he said, sure. And so I interviewed him for hours uh, in New York City, in uh, Colorado, where he had a house, in California, where, uh, which was his primary residency. And my tape recorder going, I talked to everyone who was still alive, read the books and articles, uh, delved into the presidential libraries of the legal memos on the pardon and so forth, and uh, to make, to compress the story, uh, concluded that, in fact, Ford had done the right thing, that uh, it wasn't dirty, that there wasn't really a deal. And what Ford said and what the re record supported is uh, Ford realized that the country needed to get over Watergate, that uh, if Nixon was indicted, tried, even put in jail or something like that, it would be two or three more years of Watergate, and that he wanted his own presidency and felt the country needed to move on to other issues. It was the middle of the Cold War, great, significant economic problems and so forth. And so I wrote this in the book and, and essentially uh, mea culpa, that I assumed there was something that was dirty in a deal. It turned out uh, it was the courageous thing to do. Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of John Kennedy, called me up and said she read this and that they had decided they are going to give Gerald Ford the Profiles and Courage Award for giving Richard Nixon a pardon. And then there was Teddy Kennedy uh, at the Kennedy Library giving this award to Gerald Ford. Teddy Kennedy, who at the time in 1974 denounced the pardon as corrupt and a deal, uh, saying he, too, was wrong. That, in fact, what uh, Gerald Ford did was gutsy. Courageous probably cost him uh, being elected president in his own right uh, in 1976. Now, th this seared uh, itself into my brain. It looks one way, for sure. This is the way it is. And it turns out when you look at what happened uh, through the lens of history, indeed, uh, but by saturation reporting, it looks the exact opposite. So, in 
Uh, March of 2003, uh, the, we launched the invasion of Iraq. And uh, I have written these three books on Bush and his wars, and the fourth I am at work on will be uh, out in September, Bush at War Part 4. My wife says if there's a Bush at War Part 5, she is going to shoot me. Uh, I think it will be the last uh, book. Uh, somebody in the Obama campaign said, your next book can be called Obama at Peace. <laughs> uh, the Iraq War is the most important thing going on uh, in the world right now. It, uh, a war, war always is defining. If, if you travel abroad at all, it defines who we are. The Iraq War does. If you think about it in a more important way, it defines who we are to ourselves, this war. And the, the outcome uh, is going to determine essentially uh, the place the United States has in the world in the coming decades. It is uh, a truly defining event. So when the invasion uh, was launched in March of 2003, the Washington Post said to me, take one year and uh, find out what happened and why. And it's a great luxury in any, how many people here in your business or life have ever been able to spend one year on one thing? Raise your hands. Couple, academics, right? <laughs> right, <clears throat> okay. Academics and journalists. Uh, and so I w worked through sources uh, in the intelligence world, the Pentagon, the military, State Department, the White House, low level, worked up through the information chain to assistant secretaries, people uh, in sensitive positions in the White House or the intelligence world, finally the cabinet officers, and assembled, uh, I would say after <clears throat> nine months, quite an account of what had gone on behind the scenes, the 60%, 70% solution. And I wrote this out uh, in a memo, 21-page memo in chronological order, and I sent a copy of that memo to President Bush. My colleagues at the Washington Post said, you sent, what, you, what, you Woodward, sent George Bush a 21-page memo? You have finally lost it. <laughs> there's no evidence, one said, there's no evidence in all of his years at Andover, Yale, and Harvard Business School that he ever read anything that long. <laughs> Wrong. He read it right away. Condi Rice, the national security advisor, called me in and said, you are going to write this series for the Washington Post, and you are going to uh, write your book, whether you talk to the president about this or not. And I said, of course. She said, he will see you tomorrow. So for two afternoons, I interviewed him for a total of three and a half hours. Uh, researchers at the Post have looked at this, and as best we can tell, it's the longest interview a sitting president has ever given on a single subject. Now, in three and a half hours of interviewing George W. Bush, how many questions do you think I got to ask? <clears throat> Somebody. Somebody said one. Uh, that would be if it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> and in that case, that might be high. I think it's possible to interview Clinton for three and a half hours and never ask a question. <clears throat> uh, in the case of Bush, I asked him 500 questions. He gives short, direct answers. And uh, if you were to look at a transcript of it, you would see it's very much like a legal deposition. It's not, what did you feel about Saddam Hussein, but on this date, uh, there was this meeting, or there, there was this intelligence report, or Secretary of State Colin Powell wanted to do the following. What did you think? What, why did you do it? 
What did Cheney say? What was your attitude? Uh, what was the conversation like with Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, on this date and so forth? It's, it's truly uh, an excavation of his mind and the a detailed look at the road he walked. Now, it's, in war, as uh, it has evolved in this country, the president, as commander-in-chief, can employ the force as he sees. There, there's no vote in the National Security Council. Uh, the Congress did vote resolutions supporting a war if Bush decided, but he truly is the decider. I was talking to a group recently and uh, trying to make this point, and they said, no, wait a minute, the Constitution says co only Congress can declare war. The uh, Constitution says that, but Democratic Republican presidents in the modern era have exercised their authority as commander-in-chief to go to war uh, as they determine, and they can send the force. And I was making the point, I said, look, George Bush could invade Mexico tomorrow if he wanted, and somebody yelled out, don't give him any ideas. <laughs> but he has that authority. So it is uh, on his head and shoulders that he made this decision, and the question is, what did he do? Why? What is the, the question pulsing? always throughout a discussion like this with the president who's made a war decision. Why? What'd you do? What were you thinking? What'd people say? What data did you have? What did you bring to the table? What were your attitudes and assumptions? And um, I won't go through it, <coughs> it all. It's in <coughs> the second book uh, I did called Plan of Attack, uh, which takes that 16-month period after 9-11 and uh, how and, Bush, and why Bush decided to go to war. But at one point in this discussion, not because of something I asked, but uh, all on his own, he just said the following. I believe we have a duty to free people, to liberate people. Now think about that, duty. <clears throat> It is the biggest word in the English language for a sitting president. Uh, and a, a duty to free and liberate people, I, and I challenged him. It's not in the Constitution, it's not in any law. And I just said, aren't <clears throat> lots of people going to think it's dangerously paternalistic of the United States to say uh, we have this duty to liberate people? And then he really got excited and started slapping me around, N not physically, <laughs> uh, but verbally. And he said, you don't get it. You do, do not understand. You're an elitist. Imagine being called an elitist by George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> but I took it. And uh, he said, and not understand, you've got to realize, he said. And I tell you, he is jumping in his chair in the Oval Office when he says this. You've got to understand that those of us who took our countries to war, Tony Blair, Great Britain, uh, himself, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, we have a zeal, President's word, zeal to free people. Now, zeal, second biggest word in the English language for sitting president. Uh, if we had uh, <coughs> Hillary Clinton, Senator Obama, and John McCain here on the stage, and we gave them sodium pentothal, the truth serum, it might take a lot of the drug. <laughs> and, we, and, and we said, what do you feel a duty to do beyond the Constitution and the laws? What do you have a zeal to do as president? We would know an immense amount about them. I cite this uh, as even now, 2,000 
and eight, uh, as we've you know passed the f the fifth anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, that the driver. There are lots of other reasons why we went to war, but the driver for Bush, the person who decided, is this do, sense of duty and this sense of zeal. Now, you may argue against it and uh, hate it, but it is a fact. And I, I cite it now in 2008 because you have to understand that to account for his persistence, his refusal to alter course, really, to uh, stick with it, that he uh, believes in that duty and uh, that zeal. Now, the third book I did on Bush was called State of Denial and examined what happened in the three and a half years uh, after the invasion in the title uh, tells it all, that uh, it, as things got worse and more violent, month after month, year after year, there's denial. A sense in the White House and the Pentagon, well, we're, everything's going fine, we're making progress. The reports would come in, uh, violence in Iraq to the point where there were over 100 attacks a day that's four an hour. Think about that. In this country, we haven't had one terrorist attack uh, since 9-11. Having a country the size of California, one, four attacks an hour on the average. A level of violence that is truly inconceivable to you and I. Uh, throughout this whole process, uh, there is uh, classified reports showing how violent it is getting, and the president regularly is saying, we've turned the corner. Uh, this marks the moment in history when the terrorists begin, began their retreat. Or uh, Vice President Cheney saying the terrorists are in their last throes. When all the secret information, the private information, shows it's getting worse and worse and worse. Two quick examples. Uh, after uh, oh, it was May of 2006. Rumsfeld was still Defense Secretary. He'd been Defense Secretary and, and helped plan the war, was the, uh, really the one person who was in charge, its President, Secretary of Defense, and then the generals. He wrote a, and again, this not public, they stamp it secret, a memo to the President and the National Security Council saying uh, everything's so screwed up in the interagency process and Iraq that, quote, competence is next to impossible. Competence is next to impossible. That's not some Democrat or a columnist for the Washington Post or somebody from a think tank. That's the sitting Secretary of Defense saying, Competence is next to impossible. I could give uh, example after example of the secret interior discussion, the classified reports showing how bad it is where in public uh, they put up the face, everything is good, we're making progress, uh, things are getting better. And one of the things going back to Watergate I've, I've thought about uh, is in, in, in a sense uh, trying to pick the things I'm going to write about, whether it's the CIA or the Supreme Court or presidents or particularly presidents in war, is what in all of the troubles that uh, this country has, what should we worry about most? Uh, What's the thing that will do us in? And uh, my personal conclusion is the thing we should worry about above war, the economy, health care, the environment, all pressing, urgent problems. But the thing to worry about most is secret government. That, that's what Watergate was about. 
Nixon and a group of people essentially saying, ah, we have the power, we can do whatever we want, we're going to do it this way. That's what uh, too much of the Bush administration has been about, secret government. And uh, it was one of the Supreme Court justices who said, uh, democracies die in darkness. And th I think that's exactly right. If we don't know what goes on, if we are uh, subjected to secret government, that's going to take everything away. And that, that is the peril in all of this. And that we, presidents can come and go, governments can come and go, but if they uh, operate and function outside of the daylight, we're not going to know, and we're going to lose uh, the democracy uh, that we have. And that the, uh, I demonstrated here in Detroit uh, by the newspaper getting uh, these uh, text messages of uh, the mayor and his chief of staff showing a completely different relationship, I'm laundering. Uh, what happened, apparently, allegedly, uh, and that the public face, even the sworn testimony, contradicts that time and time again. That's the story. And that it is the job of the press to say, okay, we'll listen. We want to know the explanations. We want answers but uh, also do a very independent, uh, aggressive uh, examination from other sources to find out uh, what really happened. Uh, the, I just want to spend a moment on what, what happened to Nixon. What was Watergate about? Uh, because it, uh, the, a thousand lessons in the Watergate story. And uh, as you may know, Nixon secretly taped all of his meetings in the White House and on the telephone, so there are thousands of hours of tapes. And so many that they haven't even published them all to date. And there's a new batch that comes out every season. Uh, at the Washington Post, we call it the gift that keeps giving. But there's a really, and it shows the criminality, and it shows the abuse of power uh, in uh, just uh, ways that are so clear. But I, I'm, uh, I tend to read these things or have listened to lots of these tapes, and I, I've tried to go up to 40,000 feet and say, what's this about? What's going on here? And it is... Uh, Nixon essentially saying, ah, the presidency, I've won. I have the power. I can use the presidency as an instrument of personal revenge. I can settle scores. Uh, so the IRS and the FBI and the CIA and the, you, I mean, you name it. Uh, Nixon would use the power of the government to screw, as he put it, his enemies and uh, reward his friend. But, that, but the real nightmare on these tapes and in the Nixon presidency is the smallness of it all. That it's always about Nixon. The dog that does not bark on the Nixon tapes. No one ever says, what would be good? What does the country need? It's all about, let's get somebody or let's make somebody an ambassador to Luxembourg who gave us $250,000 for the campaign. And Nixon just devoid of uh, and removed from uh, the high purpose of the presidency. Just not there. Uh, if I did another book on Nixon, which I won't, uh, it would be called The Wrong Man. He was so outside that tradition. And you can disagree with presidents, uh, two most recent ones, Clinton uh, and Bush, uh, vehemently. Uh, I've spent 
portions of my life investigating and looking at both of them, and the, the criticism uh, is valid uh, and immense. But in both of those cases, they are connected, at least in their own mind and in the tradition of the presidency, to its high purpose. That uh, if you look at the Clinton presidency, it was eight years of what? Uh, personal problems, impeachment, and acquittal, and so forth, but uh, eight years of peace and prosperity. And, you know, we could all close our eyes, and if I said, uh, if you elect so-and-so the next president, you'll be guaranteed eight years of peace and prosperity. You know, I think everyone would vote for that. Uh, in the case of, of Bush, uh, the war is his legacy, and it should be. And there's a, a mountain of evidence about all of the problems and the mismanagement, and the, uh, Obama called it uh, the other day a strategic blunder. You can make that uh, case, uh, to say the least. But as you look at it, it is not for... Uh, any, when George Bush says, I believe we have this duty, and he feels this zeal, that's the driver. That's uh, not the only reason, but it's, it's the one uh, that drives him. And in his own mind, that's connected to uh, the high purpose of the presidency. Now, what things get turned <clears throat> on their head, and... Uh, one of the most interesting moments in the Nixon Watergate period was the day Nixon resigned uh, in August 1974. And some of you may recall, because this was uh, there was video, uh, he gave he'd gone on television the night before saying he was going to resign, and. Uh, he, next day morning, he called in all of his cabinet top aides, friends, to the East Room of the White House and gave a speech, farewell speech. And he had his wife and two daughters and son-in-laws there behind him, and there was no text. It was the first time, really, in the Nixon presidency, no talking points, no written speech. And uh, it was uh, Nixon... Uh, unleashed emotionally. And he got up there and he talked about leaving the resigning and he was sweating and he was, it was a psychiatric hour almost. And he talked about his mother and his father, disappointments, quoted from Teddy Roosevelt's diary when Roosevelt writes about losing, uh, when his wife died, Roosevelt wrote, the light went out of my life forever. And Nixon compared losing the presidency to losing a spouse. And uh, then at one point, he just uh, kind of with his body language signaled, look, this is why I called you all here. And then he said the following, always remember, others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Now think about that. He realized at that moment that the, what had, the poison that had done him in was the hating. That the hating had led to his own destruction, which is exactly right. Now, it was too late. He couldn't say, you know, I, I understand what happened. I've decided to stay. <laughs> uh, but at that moment, he understood what had happened. And uh, that is amazing that uh, you have to, I am a, a, a longtime critic of Nixon, and the evidence shows what he, he attempted to uh, shred the Constitution, put simply. But you have to give him credit for his intelligence at that moment of maximum pain and despair and grief, really, to be.
be able to tell people he understood how he destroyed himself with his hate and to say don't hate and that's uh, probably the last part where Nixon really connected to uh, the American political tradition or was disconnected from. I mean, politics gets ugly and tough and rough. Uh, but Nixon was the real hater. He, he, he hated with a passion. And uh, as he said, it destroyed him. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention before we do uh, questions is uh, many years ago I'd finished one of my books and the head of Simon & Schuster, which has published them all, uh, took me out to dinner in New York City. And I thought, oh, this, you know, this is either good news or bad news. And uh, I sat down and he said, okay, what's your next book? And I said, well, I wanted to do some reading and thinking and reporting. Looked at him and said, reading, thinking, reporting, you're an idiot. What's your next book? We are in the marketing and product delivery business. You've heard this. And uh, I resisted the whole, uh, whole evening. He's one of these people just grinds on you, grind, you know, grind and, and being there at dinner for two hours alone. And so finally, at, at the end, I said, I figured out what my next book is going to be. And he said, oh. It lasts. What? I said, my next book will be on the publishing business in New York City. <laughs> and he smiled and he said, that's fantastic. I have a great title for you, for your book on the publishing business in New York City. I said, what? And he said, your book on the publishing business in New York City will be called My Last Book. He really meant it. <laughs> the only sincere thing the man had ever said. I have not yet written that book, but maybe someday. Thank you very much.